check, check. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for coming out uh, this evening to hear what I think you're going to find is a, a pretty exciting talk about physics and other stuff. Uh, I'm Tony Sonsi. I'm the chair of the physics department here at Texas Lutheran University. We're really excited because this is kind of our big day. This is like the Super Bowl of the physics department. So we're uh, really excited to have a great speaker. I do need to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, this event is made possible by the Student Government Association who helps SPS put this on in conjunction with the Department of Physics. And we also receive funding from the Brown Cultural Endowment Foundation, which is uh, very helpful in allowing us to bring excellent speakers on campus uh, like the one you're gonna hear from tonight. I'm really proud of the group of students that we have here at Texas Lutheran. We have a great bunch of very enthusiastic uh, young people who have great futures ahead of them. And uh, I'm gonna turn the podium over to one of those students, uh, the president of the Society of Physics Students at Texas Lutheran, Emily Churchman, who will introduce our speaker. Hey everybody. So like she said, I'm Emily. I'm the president of the Society of Physics Students here at TLU. I'm a senior, so say some prayers for me as I embark on grad school next year, hopefully. Um, but as president, I get to have the honor of introducing our speaker. So tonight we have Dr. Renee Horton. She's native to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and has always loved NASA. She graduated in 2002 from Louisiana State University with a BS in electrical engineering and then went on to obtain her PhD in material science at the University of Alabama. And this, when she graduated in 2011, it made her the first ever African American to graduate from LSU in this field. Uh, I'm sorry, University of Alabama in this field. Thanks, girl. <laughs> she currently works at the NASA Residential Management Office at Machoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. I know I messed that up, but it's fine. Um, and then in 2016, she was elected president of the National Society of Black Physicists and was the second woman to hold this position. She's a member of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, Women in Physics Working Group, and in 2017, she was made a fellow of the National Society of Black Physicists, and this is the highest honor you can be bestowed in this community. She's also the author of many children's books, uh, Dr. H Explores the Universe, Dr. H and Her Friends, and Dr. H Explores the ABCs. And so when I found out that Dr. H was gonna be our speaker and she accepted our invitation for this event, uh, I was really excited. Honestly, I'd never heard of her before. But then I went and read her bio, and the first sentence on her page says, hearing impaired black physicist, mother of three, that's who I am, that's who I be, but that's not everything. And read, read, reading that, and right now, I get chills immediately, and it's just amazing. And I got to speak with her earlier, and she's made such a huge impression on me. Um, and so, I'm super honored, as I said before, and without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Renee Horton. Thank you, love. So I learned late, <clears throat> these shoes are not wood shoes, but so y'all have to bear with me tipping on the stage. Um, good afternoon. It is truly an honor to actually be here. <clears throat> when I got the email, I had no idea where Texas Lutheran was. And um, I kept telling people, I'm going to San Antonio. And they said, no, you're not. <laughs> but it's OK. So I drove in, running late. You guys had bad weather yesterday. And I didn't know about it until yesterday. And then I got to the airport. And then I really found out how bad the weather was. So I was getting a little nervous. But they said, this is one of the largest turnouts they've had for physics night. So I'm truly honored that you chose to be here with me tonight. I tell people all the time that time is something you don't get back. So at the fact that you're here with me, I want to make sure that you get what you need or came for tonight, simply because you can't take this time back from me. Even if you got up and ran out right now, I still had a little bit of your time. So I want to thank you for that. I have to start with a little housekeeping. Um, NASA thinks they get to control everything that comes out of my mouth. That ain't going to happen. 
So I have to tell you that this presentation is my presentation, that these opinions are my opinions. And actually, if they were to listen to me on some, some stuff, we'd be a lot smarter, but that's okay too. So you know that nobody at NASA believes anything I say almost sometimes, but these words are my words and they're not theirs, and so they're not representing NASA at all. My dream was to be an astronaut. At nine, I got a telescope and for the very first time, I looked past what I could see, and I was hooked. I was in awe of the stars. And every now and then, with that telescope, I could see another planet. I wanted to be an astronaut. And that was my focus. And so when I put my plan together in life, it was to be an astronaut. Today, I'm a NASA engineer. I'm a physicist. She said I was the past president, immediate past president, and I've served on the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics Working Group for Women. And we've traveled all over the world. I'm a mentor. I'm a founder of a nonprofit called Unapologetically Being. And I'm gonna talk about that. But I truly believe that whatever you decide to be in life, you should be able to be that without apologizing to anybody about who you are. Because when you can give yourself 100% to whatever you're giving it without having to fight all the other things that go along with life, it's so much better. I'm a speaker. I have a creative space with Dr. H. I'm a hearing loss advocate, and I'm a mother. I always list mother last, because actually, for me, it's my most important accomplishment. There's gonna be a day that I'm gonna actually stand and watch astronauts go into space. And it's gonna be on the rocket that I helped build. And for me, it's still gonna be the fact that I'm a mother, that I have a legacy, that I created a legacy that will live past me, that will be the most important thing to me. The start of my path, I told you about that telescope at nine. So, my dad then will tell you I was pretty good at uh, convincing people of doing things they had no business doing, even when I was young. And so we were not allowed to scale the uh, antenna on the side of the house to get on the roof. But when you tell a child what they're not allowed to do, that's usually what happens. So Christmas night, when I got the telescope, I convinced my brother that he too should scale the antenna so that we could go and look. My brother wasn't interested in science at all. He just wanted to make sure that I didn't break my arm again, getting off the roof, because he got in trouble the first time. So Christmas night, we scaled the antenna, and I went to look at the stars. And at about 3 a.m., my brother said we were gonna be in trouble because my dad had to go to work the next morning. So we had to get down, get back in the window, seal it back like dad had sealed it. He put this tape on it to keep saying, I know you're crawling out the window, don't do that, right? But we got back in. That was the beginning for me. I was in a two-parent home at that time and my parents divorced when I turned 13. And I went from being middle class to being dirt poor. I went to where my mom made just enough money to where she didn't qualify for food stamps, but not enough money to keep our lights on all the time. So sometimes I'd get a call from my mom in the afternoon and she'd say, you need to go run the water in the bathtub and in the buckets. They're gonna turn the water off today. And it's not coming back on till Friday till I get paid. And for a long time, I didn't realize that that wasn't normal until I told the story, right? And people was like, oh my God. And I was like, wait, that never happened to you? And there were some people who said, well, yeah. And there were other people who said no. And I said, oh, yeah, it was just part of our norm. Like, we knew if it was going to happen, then it happened. Sometimes the lights got turned off, and you lit a candle and you did your homework. The catch was, you still went on with life. So those things happened. But it was such a pivotal point in my life that that's what I remember. I remember pre-divorce and post-divorce. I remember pre-telescope, post-telescope. I started college at 16. It was weird. I looked 14. So I was there. I was kind of a freak of nature for them. They were like, what's the kid doing in the school? 
So I didn't have like a really normal social life. And so I tell people all the time, I'm still missing social cues. I'm 47, I still miss social cues. Simply because I didn't really have them like normal people did. At 17, I was diagnosed with my hearing loss. And it was the day I had gone in for my exam for the Air Force. I was in the Air Force ROTC and I had decided I was gonna be an officer. And that was how I was gonna go through NASA and become an astronaut. And I remember I went in and the guy said, do you listen to loud music? I said, no, I don't. He says, have you ever had damage to your ears? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, have you ever had tubes? And I said, no, sir, never had an infection. Nothing's wrong with my hearing, no nothing. He said, oh, there's a lot wrong with your hearing. He says, you don't qualify. And I watched him mark a big red X against reject. I had just been rejected. So at 17, the entire dream that I had been dreaming since I was nine had just ended. And I really didn't know what to do or where to go. Well, I turned to my boyfriend and that got me trouble too because then I ended up pregnant. <laughs> well, we figured that out real quick. Like that's not the path to go, but I'm joking. I ended up, my dad said, you're pregnant, you'll get married. So I got married. I became a mom and a wife and I followed his career and I kept thinking, man, this was not a good idea, right? Because I was at home not really living up to my potential or the things that were running around in my brain all the time, right? So my kids were souped up stuff at Halloween because their mama had all this other stuff going on in her head. And so you'd push buttons on my kids' costumes and they'd go, I went and bought the same one from the store. That's okay, we rigged it at home. You can't do that. So I spent my time following my army husband for six years and then we, seven, and then we divorced. I'm back at square one. The difference is I now have three kids and I had one that was less than two. So I had the two boys and my daughter. Now I often tell people that when my daughter was born, they brought her to me after I had labored, very short labor, right? But I had labored, I gotta make the story great. And they put her in my arms and she looked at me and she said, what are we gonna do? Now my mother was in the audience once and she said, oh God, she was intoxicated on drugs. Don't listen to her, the baby was not talking. But I was looking in my daughter's eyes and I really thought about what was I going to do at that moment, at that point in life. Because I realized that she was here now and even though the boys were here, I tell them all the time, the boys were like my sidekicks, right? They just kind of went along with anything. Hey, we're gonna go bungee jumping today. Okay, mom, that's cool, let's bungee jump, right? So they were like that for me, they were my buds. But when my daughter came, I realized I wanted the world to be different. I realized right at that moment when I was looking in her eyes, and she was just a couple of hours old, she didn't talk though, but she was a couple of hours old and she said to me, what are we gonna do, right? And I said back to her, I'm not sure. And she said to me, you need to get it together. So that conversation happened, maybe in my head, maybe out loud, I'm not sure, but it happened for me. It was what she communicated in her eyes. And I knew that day I wanted the world to be different for her. So I went back to school two years later with her. Well, she was a little less than two when we started. And life became different for me for them and for her. Boom, this happens, right? So I go back to school, I get my electrical engineering degree in two years because I had already had some credits, right? So two years later, we're walking across the stage. We're all excited. And they were like, what do we do now? And I was like, I have no earthly idea. I was not smart about this. I did not look for a job. So I have no job. <laughs> so my professor said, you have no job, go get a PhD. We went. Boom, now we're in a PhD program. And then the kids were like, why are we doing this? You're gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be a doctor. I ended up the first African American to receive my degree in this area. And I was telling the uh, students earlier today, they were asking me the good and the bads and those kind of things. Well, the bad to me was the fact that everybody knew I was going to be the first. And so I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders. 
all of my good and all of my bad. And I told them earlier, the janitor is the one who told me that I had failed my qualifier. The janitor is the one who told me I had passed my qualifier and I was gonna have cake and ice cream. After I started working for NASA, that's a funny story too, I had gotten fired from my first job. I was a nosy rosy at the job, right? And I was like, why do we do this like this? Can somebody explain to me? Is it just history? I'm not understanding. You know if you did this a little bit different, this could be a little bit different? And they came in and they said to me, you don't fit the mold we need for this job. And I was fired. And so I went out and called my sister. I said, girl, I just got fired. She said, you sound real happy. I said, I hated that job. It's not NASA. I want to go back to NASA. So now I'm fired and I'm working out because you're supposed to go work out your stress, right? And I'm walking on the track, fired with no job. And I got to figure that out real soon too. I had enough money to carry me for three months. So I get the phone call and it's HR from NASA. And they say, we have a job for you. And I said, you have a job for me? She says, we have a job for you. And I said, you have a job for me? She says, I am not sure why we have a job for you if you can't comprehend that statement. But it was right there at that moment, I was kind of overwhelmed when she was talking to me simply because I had given up on that dream and let it go so many years earlier. But standing there, having them call me not me go after them, because I didn't even put in an application. But for them to call me and say that they had a very specific job that I filled and had the skill set for was overwhelming for me at that moment. See, I didn't even realize it until I got to work on the hardware program that my life had come full circle. So maybe I should have taken time while I was at the track, too busy crying because I had gotten a job and I was going to be able to feed people, right? And taking that moment to say, even when life throws you a curveball and you've ended up down paths and you've gone crooked, you can still circle around and achieve what you want to achieve. See, I understand that now, though. When I started working for NASA, they put me on a hardware program. We had not had a hardware program in over 30 years. And it was the first time we were going to be building hardware up at Marshall in Alabama for the first time. And I was allowed to be able to work on that program. Well, as one of the benefits, you got to write your name on the hardware. That's my name right there. And I wrote my kids' names because, see, they've been through all of this with me. And I wrote my sister's name because she said I never do anything for her. So I put her name on the hardware, too. <laughs> and... Um, I was dating this guy and I put his name on the hardware too and we're not dating anymore because I think that relationship burned up on re-entry. <laughs> so ladies, don't do that. And guys, only do that if you want to get rid of her, right? But I got to write all of our names on there and then that is the launch. That is the launch with my name on it. That is the launch with my dissertation work on it. That is the launch with my work ethic, my integrity, my soul on it. It launched 2014 of December. And I cried and cried and cried because I had finally gone into space. I currently work on the Space Launch System, which is the largest rocket in the world. And I know Elon around here bragging about he did some stuff, but my rocket is still bigger than Elon's rocket, OK? Now, we haven't launched yet, but we're getting there, all right? And Elon blew up some stuff before his happened, and I'm not planning on doing that. <laughs> the core stage is the center part of the rocket, and that is the part we are responsible for in New Orleans, from the tip of the white all the way up to the top. That includes a hydrogen tank, which is 157 feet long, an oxygen tank, which is about 127 feet long. The four engines come from Stennis. The boosters come from Utah. Orion is welded in New Orleans and then sent to Florida and outfitted, and then the cryogenic propulsion stage, part of it is welded in Huntsville, and it is also sent to Florida as well. This is my team. So I shaved my head bald um, when my aunt was diagnosed with cancer a second time, and I allowed her to shave me. And so for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, my team went pink. 
We all wore these high visibility pink shirts and they allowed me to spray paint people's hairs and goatees and eyebrows and crazy things like that and people's bald spots had paint on it, just crazy stuff, right? And I tell that part of my story and a part of my life because we had just spent 18 months together, maybe two years together, working to correct a problem. And so everybody knew everybody intimately. And that's one of the things that's gonna happen. You're gonna graduate, you're gonna go on to do your careers, and you're gonna end up on a team. Some of you are already on a team. But you're gonna end up on a team, and you wanna be able to support your team members. You wanna be able to say at that moment when you are looking at them, that you accept them for who they are, and that you can support who they are and what they believe in. My team did this for me. This is the Vertical Assembly Center. It was the first two years of my life down in New Orleans at Mishu Assembly Facility. And it's the largest well tool in the world. It stands about 185 feet um, uh, tall and it wells right at 23 uh, feet circumferential. Circumferential is what it does. It's a unique tool. It's the only one of its kind. It was designed by a group out of Sweden and we have it here in New Orleans. It's a beauty. She is referred to as a she, because she is very difficult. She gives everybody a lot of trouble on most days. It was where I spent the first two years of my life. This is the well, that, the very first well that was complete off this tool, and I cried. It takes three hours to do that well. He's my Viking. He really is a Viking. You would notice in this video there are two females. Sometimes you walk into an area and there are no females. I would have never thought anything that was just made out of steel with no heart and no soul could bring, could reduce us to tears. And she does. There are a select group of people, less than 50 of us, who know the inner workings of this tool, that knows what she can and cannot do, that knows how to turn her on, that have even touched her control. I have the honor of being one of those 50. This is our first liquid hydrogen tank being produced. You see, we added the music to make it very dramatic. But it was building a big old tank in 60 seconds. babies in the facility. This was the first time we had ever built one, the first time we had ever moved one, the first time we had ever laid one down. That's my head. It's a shame, you know, they only give me these small cameos just from the back sometimes. But. So past president of an organization that's about 350 members in it at this time. I was the second woman to hold the office. The last one was Dr. Shirley Jackson, and that was 33 years ago. With the International Union of Peer and Applied Physics, I've been able to travel to Brazil, South Korea, South Africa, Canada, and the UK, and I've had the pleasure of speaking in all of those places with this organization. With the IUPAP, I also had the um, honor of speaking at the UN um, for the inter first International Women and Girls Day as well, representing the organization. I'm very proud of our nonprofit. We went from being unknown to now we are swamped with mentees um, as well. We have started, we're on the process of starting our third cohort of students. These are our students. We don't just take physics students, because what I believe in is that whether you do physics or chemistry or biology or whether it's math or engineering, 
We want to help you be able to get there. I think it's very important, regardless to where you are in your life and where you are in your career, your academic career, that if you decide you want to do something, there should be people there that are willing to fight for you so that you are not just surviving, but that you are thriving. See, I want you to think about if somebody was to come and slap you right now. That's physical pain, right? Well, there's uh, some spots in your brain that light up that are associated with physical pain. If someone was to exclude you or to make you unhappy, those same spots in your brain light up as well. So if you're at work or doing whatever you're doing and you're just struggling to just survive, right? You can't give 100% because you're too busy trying to get, your brain is trying to make those sensors kind of dampen so that you can't do the other things. But if you were able to thrive and you didn't have that kind of pain going on in your brain, right, you'd be able to give so much more. You know, when I asked my team to give, I asked my team to give 110%. I want 100% at the job and I want the other 10% so that they can drive home safely and come back and do it all over again. That's important. My organization will go in and fight for you in whatever manner you need us to fight for you. I've walked in, I've gotten meetings in departments to go talk to people and say, this is happening. They are too afraid to come tell you, what can we do to help them? Whether it's writing letters of recommendation or setting up mentoring calls, we have a team that's willing to do that. I speak diversity and inclusion, motivational, my dissertation research, mentoring and outreach. To me, none of that is really important on what the topics are. But it is important to me that I'm allowed to come in and plant seeds. Because see, it's really important because there may be somebody sitting right here in this room that didn't think it was possible because they do have a kid at home. It is. Maybe it's not possible because you do have a disability. It is. Maybe you're thinking, I've already you know, detoured off the normal path. I'm here to let you know there is no normal path. You know, at work, they'll catch me all the time walking in the grass, and they know I'm looking for four-leaf clovers. So I'm always looking for the patch of four-leaf clovers. And it was, I was so obsessed with these four-leaf clovers for so long. My friends were picking them in other places and putting them in the mail to me, right? They were laminating them and said, we found you some four-leaf clovers, and they were mailing them to me. Well, that was part of my happiness list. I encourage each one of you to make a happiness list. And on that list, list 10 things that make you happy. And don't worry about how silly it is. Nobody has to know your list but you. So if it's you want to go to the park and get on the merry-go-round, do that. If that makes you happy at that moment. Because see, your happiness counters all the other stuff that's going to be part of your life. Very proud of my Dr. H Explores. So this is my creative space. And what I learned is little kids aren't as smart as their parents think they are. Because every time I meet a kid with this book, they say, when did you get back from space? And I go, I, but I wasn't in space. And they go, yes, you were. Let me go get the book. And I go, you didn't talk to your kid about this? Like I'm real, like I'm not a cartoon, I'm a real person. And they go, yes, we've had the conversation. Like, don't talk to me about my kid. But I'm like, so my mom adopted a little kid. And so he's, two, he's three now. And so every time I go to the house, he goes, sissy, when did you get back from space? And I go, I wasn't in space, love. And he goes, yes, you were. I saw the car, the car's in space. Did you not bring the car with you? I love it though. And Dr. H and her friends, it's about my real friends who do science or there's a police officer and some nurses. But the catch is the book is actually about diversity. See, a lot of times we think about diversity only in our workplace and in our workspace. And that's not where diversity should only be happening. Your life should also be diversified. Your friend group, your network, should also be diversified. You have I no idea where he is going to end up. What's your name? 
Dylan. See, guys, Dylan is going to be president of some oil company, and y'all all, all going to be like, man, I remember Dylan. Let me call Dylan, right? And then Dylan going to be like, nah, you wouldn't even be my friend in high school. Because I'm petty like that. Like, people calling me now, like, can you, mm-mm, no, we weren't even friends in high school. You was real mean to me, and you threw my books in the garbage. Mm-mm, we not friends no more. So all y'all better reevaluate being Dylan's friend over here, because when he become president of the oil company, y'all going to want to be his friend. But it is important. I laugh and I joke about that all the time. And I tell students, when you go to a conference, you want to take the three, 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 three rule. I think it's four threes now. I think we've added. So the three, 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 three rule. You want three people who look like you, three people who don't look like you, three people who are doing the research that you were doing, and then three people who are doing research you are interested in. That's 12 people. Of those 12 people, two of them may be your colleague at some point, but you've just built your network. You've just diversified your network. In psychology, diversity is considered two or more people who are different. I'll take that one. Because both of you could be white male. See, he's got on a blue shirt, he's got on a white. Y'all are perfect for my example. Look at that. But the catch is you guys are different. Totally different. You believe differently. There's no way that you're cookie cutters. You may both look similar, but you're different. So when you're looking at diversity, that is also important. I think it's very important about inclusion. So in the book on Dr. H and her friends, we talk about diversity and inclusion. In that matter that inclusion is accepting somebody for who they are, what they value, their opinion, and what they believe in. That's simple. That's just human. Dr. Renee Horton is in the house and she will be beginning her presentation in just a few minutes in the downstairs theater next to the atrium. And here for the first time, her new book, Dr. H. Gates, The Rest of the Universe. With the organization, with my nonprofit, we raise money to be able to donate the book as much as possible. And so we travel all over, and if we get a sponsor, we donate the book. The book is there to help spark the imagination. The book is there to help you believe in something else. See, I remember growing up, and when times were really hard with my mom, it was always important for me that I had the idea that there was something and somewhere else besides Earth. That's what was important to me. Here, I serve as a hearing loss advocate for the Hearing Health Foundation. And I talk about those things about getting accommodations and being able to actually live with my hearing loss. And it's funny, people say, well, you don't sound like you got a problem. I do. There are times that I struggle really hard. There are times where it's so much a noise, I can't make out anything. And as successful as I am, I feel like a failure at that moment. So I talk about it, and I try to educate other people about where we are when we talk about hearing loss and in the deaf community. You can guess what this slide is. It's my mommy's slide. My oldest is a chef. My youngest is a father and a warehouse worker. My daughter, she's working on becoming a nurse. And then my godson and my granddaughter are in the top picture. For me, family is everything. This is my ring from undergraduate. It has my initials, it has my name, but it has all of the kids' initials in it as well. So when I graduated, it was theirs as well. When I got my PhD, I walked across the stage. Each one of my kids had the diploma at their house before I got it back because it was just as much theirs as it was mine. And like I said, being a mother is my greatest legacy. It'll be the best thing that I leave on this earth and the rocket, because it's my baby too. My desire is to be happy. Marcus, pay attention. We ready? All right. My desire is to be happy. I'm gonna end with you telling you that when you find the intersection 
between your talent and your passion, you find your true happiness. Marcus is going to make me happy with the wave in this room. Come on, get out to see. <laughs> hey, can we bring it back? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we have questions. We have questions. I have about what, 20 minutes? I have tw about 20 minutes for questions. One more time. The Space Launch System, or SLS. Dr. C. So when you put the rocket together, if you're putting it in cylinders, like it's pieces, and you got what? Why don't you just build one long tube? So when you're actually looking at the rocket, even though it looks like one long tube, there's actually the hydrogen tank, which holds the hydrogen, and then the oxygen tank, which holds the oxygen. Then there's the um, inner tank, and that's the piece that connects the two tanks together, and then forward skirt in the engine section. All of those actually have uh, computing power, or br we call it the brains, in it for the rocket. So there's no way to build just one long cylinder. So because it's so big, right, so we're talking about something that's 23 feet in diameter, and on the hydrogen tank it's 157 feet long. So when you're actually looking at that, that tank is actually made up of five barrels, and each one of those barrels are made up of eight sections. If we were to actually have something just, if you were to try to go in and machine something, one big long cylinder like that, you would be walking into a, just a disaster. Because what you're looking at is, if you were to take a forging, say we take a forging, right? You take a forging, which is one big piece of metal, and try to do it like that, you'd have to be able to machine that perfectly. And you can't do, we just haven't been able to do that. So being able to put it together in pieces is the method that we've actually used even for external tank. So in building a rocket, you wanna also build off of your prior knowledge or your tribal knowledge. And that's one of the things that we're doing. We're building off of the Delta data from Boeing as well as the external tank data from NASA. Aluminum 2219. And 2219 is an alloy of aluminum and lithium and some other stuff. What was your dissertation over? <laughs> My dissertation was on self reacting friction stir welding of dissimilar alumina, mechanical properties, and failure mechanisms of a pull plug technique. Does that answer your question? <laughs> and so what I was looking at at the time was the material that we were using for Constellation, which was the program before SLS, and we were looking at how the welds actually looked like and what was the failure mechanism for them if the materials were dissimilar. And what we found is that we ended up having a, like a hot spot area where the material was being stuck close to the pin. So when you're looking at a welding pin, it has threads on it. Well, we were getting where the material was being caught up in there, and it was holding the same property as the parent material on the outside of the welds, but that ran down the center seam of the actual weld. And that was with dissimilar alumina, and so we were having a lot of problems with fracturing and couldn't understand why at one point. And then that was one of the items that we actually discovered. The other item that we looked at was when you weld in a circular pattern, you end up with a hole in the end, and you have to plug that hole. Well, that technique is called friction um, stir pull plug. And with that, you are spinning a plug and you're pulling it at the same time. It heats up right at the plastic zone for material. And that's how you seal with a plug. Well, they were saying that we thought the plug would either break at the 12 o'clock or the 6 o'clock, and it was not. It was breaking more on a 45, but it was at a tri-point area where all three materials kind of meet up together. So you had the dissimilar aluminas plus the plug which was different. And so we were getting a fracture mechanism right there because that's the highest point of strain. <laughs> yes. The book did. Is that kind of... no. 
No, I have not. I do not qualify. So I do not qualify. The closest I've been to space is my name was written on the hardware and it went to space. I know, isn't it a bummer? But that, I found out that they drink their urine and I'm good. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah. Hearing is one of them. <laughs> and I'm missing that one. Um, they just recently did, if your vision can be corrected by 2020, then you can still go. If you can have your vision corrected, you can go. But if you're in the STEM field or medical field, those are usually pretty hard uh, qualifications to be able to go. And they just did an astronaut class and they run that class. I'm not sure of all the other qualifications, but I'm almost certain if you go out there, there'll be a list of qualifications, but actually having your degree is one of them. Yes, ma'am. A long time, five years, <laughs> five years now. We're almost there though. That's what we keep saying. Oh, I didn't get fired from NASA. I got fired from the rope company. <laughs> I was building synthetic rope. And it's the same rope that they pulled the Apollo in with. And they kept saying, you know, this is not rocket science. But um, so I was actually fired from that company. I was let go. I wasn't fired. I was let go in my probationary period. But saying I was fired sounds so much cooler. <laughs> I was not a good fit for the company. Um, and for NASA, actually, my dissertation advisor for NASA had written a letter of recommendation, and he had gone to HR, and he told them, you guys have got to be stupid for letting this one go. So I had a sponsor at the time, and he's the one who kicked the door open for me. He told them that I was a good fit. And so after looking at my credentials and all the work that I had done for NASA, I really was a good fit. We, we weld at room temperature. We weld at whatever the temperature is in the facility. None of the um, areas are actually controlled and none of the welds are heated or cooled um, at all. They do put in, they do dump quite a bit of heat into the material at that time though, because we're taking the material right below its melting point. Her question is, what advice do I have for women or young girls that want to pursue STEM that could be easily um, dissuaded from it? When I was growing up, I remember that I really, really, really said I wanted to be a scientist, right? I was convinced. My grandmother had made me a lab coat and all that good stuff, right? And my dad said to me, I don't know any black people in science, so you should be an engineer. So I took the track of becoming an engineer. What I found was it still didn't stop everything that was in my head, though, that made me want to know. All the whys and the hows. And so when I started in that field, it was a lot of opposition. One, because I'm an African American. Two, because I'm a woman. What I found is my happiness is more important to me than to them. And so even though they're disgruntled about something, because when somebody decides that they don't want you in a space, it's because they see something in you that they can't control. So just remember, when people are putting up opposition to you, it's simply because they see something in you that's going to be amazing. I went back to my advisor who dumped me. I had my advisor tell me, you gotta pick and choose, and he wasn't gonna be my advisor anymore. And there was another professor who told me I was the dumbest student he had ever had. I didn't understand, um, part of my hearing loss causes it to where I do not understand speech. And for those who speak English as a second language, they're just that much more difficult for me to understand. But this one professor I didn't understand at all. And I gave the speech at the LSU commencement 
in front of 6,000, and it was the largest graduating class for engineering, and the professor was on the stage. <laughs> and he went, and I went, I had hair. Do you remember me? I'm the dumb student. And he went, no, you're the NASA engineer. I said, no, I'm the dumb student. See, that day that that professor told me I was the dumbest student that he had, I took that, and instead of letting it defeat me, I wanted to know why he felt that way. And I actually took it and examined that, and then that became one of my bricks that I was standing on. So each time somebody discourages you or tries to take something from you, you fight harder for it because you have a right to do it. So my advice to those young ladies would be that regardless of what somebody's trying to take from you, if you truly want it, it is yours to fight for. And there are plenty of us who will stand behind you while you fight. Any other questions? Yes. What would be your biggest piece of advice for someone who is balancing a full-time career, a family, and going back to school? Is it you? <laughs> <laughs> Does your wife? You like him? <laughs> Support him. It's hard, though. I, I would be, you know, my kids will tell you, if they were here, they're always interjecting in the speech, right? Tell them about that time you ain't feed us. And it's like, I didn't really not feed you. I didn't cook, okay? You had sandwiches. There's nothing wrong with sandwiches. And then my son says, but mama, we ate sandwiches for nine days straight. Peanut butter jelly sandwiches, too. I was like, listen, I was in the middle of midterms, finals, you know? You ate bread, meat, something. I know you ate something, right? <laughs> so they will tell you that. It is hard, though. And so find the little bitty crooks, though, in it, right, to kind of beat the system. If it means that when you go home, you don't study right away because you're only going to function off of four hours of sleep, sometimes that has to happen. So if it means playing with your kids or taking your wife on a quick McDonald's date, do that. Because, <laughs> see, the catch is I never forgot that my kids were part of what I was doing. Every time I had a big decision to make, even though their opinion didn't count, I still brought them in and sat them down. <laughs> and we talked about it. And they were convinced that they were part of this PhD too. Because see, there became a moment when I was gonna quit. And I came home and I was in tears and I said, I'm done, I'm not doing this. And my oldest said to me, did you become a doctor or something already? And I said, no, I'm quitting. Like, we gonna, go, we gonna go get a job. And he said, no, that was not the agreement. The agreement was we was gonna be a doctor and we are not doctors yet. <laughs> and he said, so I'm gonna need you to fix this and go to school tomorrow. You know, and I was looking at him like, how you gonna tell me do that? <laughs> you know, but you know, I had also had them buy into school. So if you're already in school and you're already working, she bought into it. Is there a bun in the oven? Yeah. Oh my Lord, all right. So you're about to have some sleepless nights. Get used to it. And when you get there, put your bag down, go to the baby. Take the baby from her, change the baby, rock the baby, love the baby, right? Let her catch a nap. <laughs> it's gonna be okay if you feed him sandwiches, I promise. <laughs> Any other questions? The little ones, raise his hand. You got a question? No, okay. <laughs> Changed his mind over there. Yes. Uh, so you do a lot of work with aluminum. Is there any green material that if you didn't have to worry about the funding of it that you would use to build, say, your next project after an SLA? I haven't. I can honestly say I haven't even thought about any of that. I'm just so concerned that they aren't tearing this thing up, man. I, I, I don't even have time to dream. My dreams are... Oh God, nobody's calling me in the middle of the night. I don't, I, I don't even know. Um, one of the, uh, f a friend of mine just called and they're gonna build a smaller scale rocket. So I'm actually gonna get some time to examine to see if there, what materials are out there and what would be good for a liquid propulsion type rocket system outside of aluminum. Um, you have to worry about when you're looking at materials, it's not just whether or not it's a dream material, right? You've got to actually look at how does it function in both environments 
so your cryogenic environment as well as your regular environment. And then you also have to look at how are you going to be able to weld it, how are you going to be able to bolt it, if you're going to be doing those things, how easy is it to drill and those kind of things. So that would be the only thing. Right now they're doing a lot more with Inconel, and Inconel can be a little heavy, but it has great properties in it. So I could see maybe being able to you know, ramp up some more with Inconel or titanium. So. I'm sorry, there's a hand on it. I saw you too. I will get her first. Um, so you said you, uh, you got hired? I did. NASA. No, not NASA. NASA. The rope company. The rope company. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the area that I work in is called non-conformances, and so it's like you have requirements that you build, like your bookshelf to, right? And if you follow those instructions, and let's just say one of those nails or whatever, the screw comes out the bottom, and now you've messed it up at the bottom, right? And so my group actually goes in and evaluates how much weight would still be able to go on that shelf, right? And if we could still use it or if we have to replace it. And so in there, we do a lot of, um, procedures and documentations and things like that. And I don't get to make a lot of changes um, in that, but I do get to evaluate and say, maybe that's not good or that's, that, that's not gonna work. I just recently switched over to quality and safety, so I'm hoping my voice will be able to be a bigger voice in that department. All right. So I skipped kindergarten, so I skipped kindergarten, and then once in middle school, we were allowed to take high school credits, and then once in high school, I was allowed to take college credits. And so by the time I got to 11th grade, the only thing I was needing, I was missing at that time, was going to be two classes from my senior year and English, my 12th grade English. And I took my 12th grade English by correspondence which allowed me to graduate. I'm an October baby. And so I graduated in May and I didn't turn 17 until October. So I'm not really that smart. You know, it's just the luck of the draw when I was born, that's all. But it's pretty cool to be able to say that. Yes. Huh? It is not available today, but, um, Tony went and ordered on Amazon. It takes a long time from Amazon. Um, but if you want to go on and order at drhexplores.com, then once I get back, we'll get them in the mail for you and get them back. And I can scribble my signature in there as well. But I do have one to give away today. <laughs> yes. Because that's where we're going to change our future at. You know, once we get to adults, we're all set in our ways and we've already created our own biases and we've already got an idea of what the world should be like. But if you catch them as kids, you can, ch you can change the world through them, through their perceptions, through their eyesight. So we figured we'd go at that level and do kids. So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I ask all of you to stay in here for a few more minutes, um, but let's give our speaker a round of applause. And if she would please stay on stage, we have a gift for her. Is it a cup Maybe. and a pen? Maybe you should open it. And let me see. And a, oh my God, there's little people. It's a dog. Oh, oh it's a dog. I'm, so I'm collecting cups from around the world where I go, so I did get a cup. <laughs> and a t-shirt. Thank God, because it's a lot, it's real cold in that hotel room. And then we have one more surprise for you. So, as you know, uh, before I came to Texas Lutheran, I was the director of the Society of Physics Students in Sigma Pi Sigma National Honor Society. So when the national office heard that we were gonna have Dr. Horton here, they said, <laughs> Could you please induct Dr. Horton into the Sigma Pi Sigma oh, 
National Honor Society. So I've only been begging for two years. <laughs> so there have been several attempts to try to induct Dr. Horton, <laughs> as we learned today at lunch, and uh, she's been oh. elusive. So I'm very honored that uh, our little honor society here at Texas Lutheran gets to be the ones. For those of you that, that oh. don't know much about Sigma Pi Sigma, it's pretty old. It was founded in 1921 at Davidson College. It was originally a fraternity, but shortly after its inception, it was figured out by the smart physicists that it couldn't be a fraternity and it was uh, turned into a society. We exist to honor scholarship, encourage interest in physics, promote service, and provide fellowship. And we think uh, Dr. Horton uh, fits this bill pretty well. Uh, Sigma Pi Sigma is the member of the Association of College Honor Societies. It's affiliate member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and an organization of the American Institute of Physics which is the parent organization for the Society of Physics Students. We have insignia like any good honor society, and I'm not gonna read uh, the Greek, but uh, all the insignia are on the stuff that we're about to give uh, Dr. Horton now. My favorite is the Sigma Pi Sigma insignia has the word Sophia in Greek on the bottom, which means wisdom, the Greek feminine for God. Um, it was established, this chapter that we will induct Dr. Horton into was established in 1963 for at-large members. It contains some pretty uh, important people and uh, Dr. Horton will be the 105th uh, signature on the Red Book, which was shipped to us from the national office so that she could put her signature in it. Uh, so please uh, help us congratulate uh, Dr. Horton. So we're all going to shake her hand and tell her congratulations. So uh, please join us in the party barn down the street in just a few minutes. Please come to the stage.